I'm going to start the recording, minimize this. And my expectation is today's a little bit shorter. I don't know that I'll take the full 50 minutes so we can have cl uh, questions at the end. I do want to start off pointing out some things I did to you because one more week, right? Uh, semester ends next Thursday. We don't have class on Thursday, so uh, we'll be done with class next Wednesday. I want to show the Canvas page, which, yep, there you go. Come on, is it sharing? Let's make sure that took, because I don't see it doing what it's supposed to do. Share. I don't see the green border, so I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to share again. All right, where's Canvas? Canvas, Canvas. Uh, right there, share. Now I see the green border. Okay, so you may have been seeing it all along. His, this is the, uh, the part of chapter four that we're in right now, anger, momentum, and spin. Uh, hydrogen atom was what we've been talking about before. And I guess the um, thing I'm pointing out is today, of course, the anger, momentum tutorial is due. Some people have already turned it in. That's great. Uh, we're working on spin right now. So that's what we'll be talking about. That's not due till next Monday. Um, so you got Friday off, I guess, but I wouldn't uh, put it off. I would do this. And there's also um, a homework. It's the last one. Yay. Homework eight. Um, it's due the 29th. If I'm doing my math right, well, today's the 22nd. Um, so that would be uh, seven days from today. That'd be due next Wednesday. Five problems. It's a little longer this time, but it's all of chapter four. Um, it's kind of encompassing. And I think it's a good practice to be ready for the, the final exam, which is uh, Tuesday of final exam week. My expectation, my hope is it's sometime Sunday night or Monday morning, I'll upload the final exam. It should be just very similar to the, uh, to the second midterm, uh, perhaps just a little longer because I think our final exams are supposed to be about two and a half hours. And uh, hopefully it won't take you that long, but who knows? Open book again, open resource. Uh, you can use the internet. Not, no other human being can help you complete it. It has to be your own work. And that's the only requirement, okay? So that's what we got coming forward. If you're looking at worksheets, um, this is the spin. On Friday of this week, we'll be talking about interactions between spin and magnetic fields. You may have heard of the Zeeman effect. We'll be talking about that um, on, on Friday. Uh, next week, I still haven't decided. I think I'm going with uh, adding of angular momentum of multiple particles, but I, st I, I think I may have told you I'm, I'm, I haven't decided 100%. I'd I, I think it's, it's unfortunate that we lost a couple days and I can't at least introduce you to perturbation theory, which is a, a very important part of quantum mechanics. Uh, I haven't decided, we'll see. I, I don't think it's, it, it would be good to split the difference because then you'd kind of get a mediocre view of both. I, I have to make a decision. I just quite frankly haven't made it yet, but it'll be one of those two. So I, you can anticipate two more worksheets, definitely um, electromagnetic effects on spin, magnetic effects on spin, and then, We'll either next week either do um, perturbation theory or um, or the adding of angular momentum for multiple particles. Okay, so we'll stop sharing this and we'll shift on over. I want to uh, show you something that actually came, I didn't catch it until uh, office hours on Monday. So let me share with you, where is it? Acrobat, yep, worksheet hydrogen two tutorial. Okay, and um, one of the things I did notice, and I pointed out to everybody, uh, was a slight difference in notation between what our textbook does and what this tutorial did. And uh, I commented afterwards to somebody, I forget who I said it to, if I had to do it over again, I'd have retyped this tutorial. But at the same time, um, it's consistent with itself, but it's a slight difference in notation from our textbook. And specifically, um, originally I just said, hey, the Laguerre polynomial looks good. Somebody pointed out there is a problem compared to our book. Our book dis, uh, defines the Laguerre polynomial with Q factorial right here. And at first I thought that was a typo when somebody pointed it out in office hours. And then we came to realize, I think Jacob Stein, uh, 
said, oh, that's why. My comment was, it's really not an important piece because it's just a constant out front. You can put constants anywhere. We slide those things around when we're working physics problems all the time. All, it, all this set of uh, equations has to be is self-sufficient, self-consistent, and it's okay if it's not right here. Mathematicians define math functions different ways. We saw earlier when we were talking about the, um, the angular solution to Schrodinger's wave equation in spherical coordinates that uh, one of the associated Legendre polynomials is either minus the sine of theta or plus sine of theta, depending on where you look. Okay, and so two different math tables uh, might have two different things. You might go to one book. By the way, Mathematica does it with the negative sign, and that's why our author changed over to that, whereas um, other math books that I've looked at have plus. And that's just as long as you're consistent all the way through, um, it really doesn't matter. Why do we have a right-handed coordinate system versus a left-handed coordinate system? It just has to be consistent. In the world of Fourier transforms, um, there is a factor of one over two pi. And you'll see one, some math books put the one over two pi in the Fourier transform. Some put the factor of one over two pi in the inverse Fourier transform. And then some split the difference, put a factor of one over the square root of two pi in both. And so you have to just deal with those differences and whichever the person you're reading Whatever, whatever, whatever choice that person makes, all that person has to be as consistent. And I, probably the most fundamental is many, many centuries ago, mathematicians could have decided to use left-handed coordinate systems and all of our math and science would continue to work just fine. It is a convention. Okay, back to the Laguerre polynomials. Our text chooses to put this here and this one doesn't. And then of course, the other thing our text does is right here, our text puts, um, let me make sure I got it right, puts a Q right there. And then right here, our text puts P plus Q. Okay, this is still P in both places, which is okay. P is the same. Uh, it's just a slight changing of index. All right, equation for the radial, Radial, sol radial solutions V function, which is part of the overall radial solution R for the energy eigenvalue problem in spherical coordinates, blah, blah, blah. Okay, is the same, but there are those two differences. We found this difference right here, thought, ooh, maybe we got a typo. And no, as it turns out, as we, on further e examination, I guess, I gotta get this to you know, pull back on down. If you look, Okay, the way our author handles the fact that he didn't put the Q factorial in the denominator of the Laguerre polynomial is he cubes, well, the author of this, this worksheet, which wasn't me, what he does is he cubes that guy right there. And if you look, this guy right here, play with it, you, you can show that is Q factorial right there. And so it's under the square root, so it's squared, and that's why this becomes cube. If you look at our textbook, specifically equation 489, it's a variation of this. Two differences, actually, in our equation 489. One is that that's not cubed. Again, we thought that was a typo, but it's not. It's just consistent with the fact that the Laguerre polynomial doesn't have a Q factorial in the, in the denominator. Instead, it gets put right here in the normalization constant for the overall wave function. So that's a big difference, not a typo. Uh, this worksheet is consistent in and of itself. There is one other difference. Um, the, the person I stole this worksheet from chose to put Z here, okay? In the case of hydrogen, Z, of course, is one. Would this work for helium where Z is equal to two? If you're gonna use that, the answer is yes, but only helium that has one electron. This is a single electron equation. Uh, you can have what's called hydrogenic helium, which is helium that only has one electron. You can have hydrogenic lithium, I suppose, where you strip away two electrons. Then you could use this equation, and instead of Z equals one, like it is for hydrogen, you'd put the atomic number of hydrogen, I'm sorry, of helium or lithium right there, two or three. I've never heard of anything higher than that being hydrogenic, but hey, I'm not, I'm not a chemist, okay? So that's, um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that is 
not a typographical error, as I originally perhaps thought. Um, there is still one typo on this handout, uh, and that was, I, I, I have to tell you, I looked at this thing multiple times, never noticed it, okay? And uh, again, Jacob Stein is racking up the finding little typos, noticed it. You ever had that paragraph that somebody, like a psychologist gives you, and they tell you to count the number of Fs that are in the paragraph? And you always miss some. Your eye, our eyes just read right by things. The typo on this worksheet, which does exist, is actually right there. Because that's not Q. That's got to be P, right? That's got to be P. Okay, so that is the typo right there. There is one on the worksheet. It's there. It's not the fact that there's no, um, there's no Q factorial right there. And I'll take either, quite frankly. Um, when I did my answer key, you'll see that I worked it out using our books uh, definition of the Laguerre and associated Laguerre polynomials, but um, it's perfectly acceptable to not have the Q prime there as long as, as long as, I'm sorry, Q factorial, not prime, uh, as long as down here you, you cube the thing, okay, one place or the other. You can slide the constant, it just, it is, it is not a, a difference. Now, half of me wonders, would I have been better serving you all had I retyped this worksheet? And on the one hand, I go, yes, because it did inject some frustration for some people, which we eventually worked out uh, during office hours. Some of you probably never even noticed it, quite frankly, is if you just use the equations in the book and ignore the equations on the worksheet, you'd have been fine. If you only use the equations on the, um, on the worksheet and ignored the equations in the book, you'd have never seen the differences. I think the questions asked on the worksheet lend themselves more to using the self-consistent set of equations on the worksheet. Um, it it, it kind of makes it a little more sense sensible. I'm wondering why our author did go to the new notation, because I think the, the notation that's on this worksheet is more clear. But um, both are consistent, and and sometimes a little bit of frustration causes you to see some details. I had I learned something, and I was I was happy to be shown some things by some of you guys. So I appreciate that. Any questions on what I just said right there? All right. Again, if there was, uh, if it, it caused you to get things wrong, I'm, you know, you may have this constant set out front here with a slightly different number than I am. I have because you did so, something slightly different right here. Um, I'll point out if you're inconsistent, but you, you're not losing points for it. Does that make sense? But any, any mathematical set of equations merely has to be self-consistent. And I think I'll delete out right there, clear those guys and stop sharing that and get on to the topic of the day, which is more of the spin that we were talking about on Monday. So let me share that with you. And why am I on that slide of all slides? I wanna start with that one, there we go. Now I'm again, not seeing the green border. So let me stop it again. Start again, make sure I see the green border, share. Uh, hopefully that's working. And all right, I'll close that so it gets out of the way. Did I start, am I recording? Let me make sure, nope, I am recording, good. Okay, you know, you get to be my age, you forget things. Uh, it's true with our politicians, it's true with me. Let's put that away. Um, we're talking about spin of a particle. And remember, classically, why is that there? Go away. Class, come on, let me have control here. Classically, uh, you, you have things like the moon going around the earth or the earth going around the sun. There's a, we call it a revolution when we're thinking about angular momentum along an orbit. And we talk about rotation when an object itself spins on its own axis. Classically, they're the same thing. They're, that angular momentum is just two different manifestations of the same idea, okay? However, for quantum mechanical particles, real small things, this spin here, this rotation, is different because we think that the, the thing is spinning has no size, which then begs the question, well, how does it have angular momentum? How does it have, uh, if, if everything is at zero radius, what is the moment of inertia? And the answer is, we think that um, elementary particles in physics intrinsically have this spin 
parameter, this spin quantity associated with them, with them uh, even though they have no, no size, which is something that you have to kind of meditate on because it doesn't agree with classical physics. And that's one of the divergences between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. But I think a significant portion of our world are these type of particles that intrinsically have spin equal to one half. I said it was protons, neutrons, electrons. It turns out all quarks and leptons. Uh, electrons are a subcategory of these things called leptons. Um, things that make up in the nucleus, that make up protons and neutrons are all quarks. And so all of them have spin one half. So it's an, an important, uh, important thing to, to, uh, to study because so much of our real world is made up of these elementary particles. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about state and uh, make sure that we're clear on what we're talking about. Um, when we're thinking about states with respect to energy, okay, the, the state was described by either that guy or the capital one of those guys, the psi function, that was the state when we were thinking about an energy basis, right? When we talked about momentum, the state was defined with this F sub P, right? Uh, when we were thinking about position states, X, we just made it an F, angular momentum, and I got to make sure I get the uh, subscripts in the right place. I think it was L, M, was the state. And now we've got a third, and you can see why F is just generic, just like F of X in any calculus class or even any algebra class is a, is a generic function. These are just generic states, but it was momentum and position and angular momentum as we use the symbol F. When we're talking about spin, the state, we give it this symbol right here, this Greek letter C, a chi, okay? And we, we think of two different types of states, what we call spin up, which is represented by that two element column vector, or this set of, um, in, the, in the ket notation, S and M, so spin one half, which is true for all of these things, right? Everything we're talking about is a spin one half particle. And then what the value of M is, there's two choices, m plus one half and minus one half. And we often see people use symbols like that to, to designate the two, call these things spinners. And so any state, psi equivalent to like, I'm sorry, chi equivalent to a psi or any of these Fs for one of these particles is a superposition of these two uh, states at spin up and spin down. And we'll see the significance here of A and B in just a second. And so last class, we went through figuring out what all the matrix operators associated with spin would be. And we realized if the spin can be expressed as a, as a column vector with two elements, the operator that's associated with these spins uh, must be a two by two matrix. Okay, and that's part of why in chapter three, we spent a lot of time with two by two matrices, didn't we? Okay, so we worked through uh, S squared, spin squared, which is analogous to angular momentum L squared. Uh, we worked through the Z component of spin. Z is just an easier component because if you look at the Z component in spherical coordinates, it's a shorter group of derivatives, right? And uh, we looked at the raising and the lowering operators for spin, and we came up with uh, uh, what the X and the Y spin operators would then be. Z was easy because it's just an easier, um, you know, Z is where the angle theta is, is specified with respect to X and Y become a little harder. But if you use the raising and lowering operators like we did here, they, they weren't that hard to, to craft out algebraically as well. And I think this is where I ended up on, uh, on Monday. Uh, uh, Linus Pauling, uh, I think the chemists claim him more than the physicists do, but to some degree he was a physicist. Linus Pauli simplified the notation for us with what are called the Pauli spin matrices for these plus or minus uh, one half M particles, these spin one half particles, up down particles. It, we, we just write the Pauli spin matrices and we just remember that Pauli factored out the, the H bar over two, which we showed was in each and every one of these S uh, components, the spin components in the three dimensions. Okay. Um, are these matrices Hermitian? I think we decided at the end they were. What are their eigenvalues? Their eigenvalues are plus h bar over two and minus h bar over two. And what are the eigenvectors? Well, uh, one, zero, and zero, one. Okay. And 
you know, just on the, the notation business that I started talking about at the start of class, uh, I, one other example just popped into my mind as I was writing this. If you use um, Wolfram Alpha to evaluate your eigenfunctions and your eigenvectors, which is a perfectly legitimate mathematical thing to do. I, uh, you don't have to work everything out by hand in a tedious fashion. Remember what I told you about eigenvectors and Wolfram Alpha? They're not normalized, okay? They're perfectly legitimate, they're self-consistent, but at the step where you go to use eigenvectors for probabilities, you must normalize them. And I think back to, I think the first week of class in chapter one, on one of the first PowerPoint slides I ever showed you when we were talking about wave functions, psi for the energy, uh, energy basis, I said, you know, one of the very first things you gotta make sure you're doing with any eigenfunction, any wave function is what we were calling them back then, you gotta normalize it. And so, you know, mathematicians don't always need that. They, so it's us physicists, because of the way we're going to use the eigenvectors, who require that they be normalized. And that's true with Laguerre polynomials and associated Laguerre polynomials and Legendre polynomials and associated Legendre functions and any other mathematical function, Bessel functions that you may encounter in your, in your life. Remember, sometimes in physics, we have extra requirements on them, like they be normalized in this case for the, for the states. Okay. So anyway, we call these spinners, eigenspinners are the eigenstates of the spin matrices here that are the X and the Y and the Z components. All right. Why? Why are they normalized? Why did I spend the time saying like that? Well, talking about all that stuff. If you measure the Z component of spin on a particle in some state, I haven't specified whether it's up or down, it's some linear combination of up and down, you would measure h bar over 2 with probability a squared, and you would measure minus h bar over 2 with probability b squared. That's the significance of these two guys. And just want to remind people, because a couple of you didn't do it, remember when you put the little railroad tracks to, de to denote a, a magnitude here, and there is a possibility that A could be a complex number, it's not for spin. But if A is ever a comp uh, complex number, remember, this thing is done by multiplying A by its complex conjugate, okay? And that's what I'm showing over here. Uh, you would measure uh, these two guys with those probabilities. Again, can't emphasize it enough, the spinner must be normalized, multiplied by its complex conjugate, a squared plus b squared has to be equal to one. If you only have one thing, one spin, one half particle here, you can't have 120% of it, right? So you can only have 100% of it, you can't have 120. So it, it, it kind of makes sense, but it is a mathematical step that you can never forget. All right, so one of the, uh, points about what this all means, I guess, is it is incorrect to say that the probability that the particle is in the spin-up state is A squared, okay? We, it, it's, that's, people say it all the time. You'll probably hear me say it. Um, you may hear some other physics professor at some point say it. It is inexact. What is actually true is that the particle is in the state chi, just like in, in the energy uh, basis, you know, the state of a particle is psi, or for momentum, F sub P is the state, or for uh, position in that basis, the, the, the state is F, or for angular momentum, it's F with a subscript L and a superscript M. The state is the state. It's true, though, that a measurement would collapse the state into, a, into one of those, an up or a down state, but the particle itself exists in the state chi. It's not until you make the measurement that you collapse. So then it would be say, correct to say that A squared is the probability that the particle is now in the state that's, that's currently, right this second, in the, the indeterminate state chi, will be in the state up subsequent to a measurement, right? That would be fine. But to say that the particle before you make the measurement is in spin up or spin down uh, state is, is just bad, 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 bad thinking. And we're going to finish off with some, some more on that. So you've got a particle. It's a spin one half particle. Its state is chi here. You make a measurement. A squared tells you what the probability of getting that eigenvalue is. B squared tells you what the probability of getting that eigenvalue is. Okay. And that's the deal. All right, so let's move on with that a little bit. Uh, move on with that idea. What, and that's supposed to say if, and 
it's a what if you measure s of x okay so we we already decided about um, about s sub z right what the probabilities are but now what if you've got this particle in state chi and you want to make a, a measurement s sub x well uh we'll take the poly spin matrix for the x component multiplied by the, uh, the the eigenvalue that he factored out okay and we'll do the eigenvalue problem okay so what does that mean i i've multiplied them back in here that's why i've got h bar over two h bar over two remember this the, the way we do this is we go s sub x on the state um is equal to the um eigenvalue that's a chi but it looks a whole lot like an x that's a chi right there. That's what I don't like about chi's. My Greek x, my Greek uh, chi's look like my x's. Any event, the way you solve this though is you then you take s sub x, you multiply this guy by the identity matrix, and you subtract it off. So I got the identity matrix times the eigenvalue, and then of course the determinant of that thing has to be equal to zero, right? I mean that is the classic way to solve an eigenvalue problem. You multiply by one, you bring this to the other side of the equation, and so you're left with zero over here, and if that those two matrices subtracted one from the other, you're adding a negative here. Uh, if they have to be equal to zero, that must mean the determinant of that thing is zero. And so I subtracted lambda off of that. I subtracted lambda off of that. So zero minus lambda is just minus lambda. And then I solved for what the eigenvalue is. And did it surprise anybody that it came out to be plus or minus h bar over two? It's kind of reassuring that that happened, that it gives some validity to the, the, the poly spin matrices. If you've got a spin one half particle, the eigenvalue, if you go to measure it, will either be plus h bar over two or minus h bar over two. That's how these spin one half particles work. Cool. All right. So I guess the question then is what are the eigenvectors? Okay. And just like you did on the midterm, hopefully you went through exactly the same process. If I take the sx operator on the chi eigenvector and that's that guy and that guy right okay which means you take this poly spin matrix e with the h bar over two and you multiply it by those two guys i did the multiplication right here h bar over two i kept out front i go zero times alpha one times beta beta one times alpha zero times beta alpha notice what happens to the uh, to the result when you do that, when you multiply by this particular poly spin matrix, it goes from alpha beta to beta alpha. But the eigenvalue equation still says that's equal to those two guys, right? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, that's, that's good. And so I, I guess what that tells me is alpha is equal to beta, right? Alpha is equal to beta. And do the same thing, I guess, for, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, because this was the eigenvalue lambda plus um, plus one half. So that's good. Do the same thing with alpha equal to minus, I'm sorry, with the eigenvalue equal to minus one half, go through the same thing. Okay, boom, boom, switches these two guys around. All right. And I guess what I get here, there's a there's a mistake right here. That's alpha and that's beta, just like it is down here. So I apologize for that. That's why I said beta is equal to alpha. Beta is equal to alpha. Okay. Any event, do the same thing on the uh, with the, the negative eigenvalue. All right. And h bar over two, zero times alpha, one times beta, beta, one times alpha, zero times beta, alpha. And now that's equal to the eigenvalue that we're talking about here. And then alpha beta. What you find in this case is alpha is equal to minus beta. Okay. But are you aware of that? And so you got two states, one where the two components of the state are the same, and one where they're negative, where they're negative to each other. Now, I wrote them like this. Why did I put a one over the square root of two, one over square root of two, one over square root of two, one over minus square root of two? Okay. Well, the answer is it has to be normalized, right? These both of these two eigenvectors, whether it's a plus sign or a minus sign right here, which in both cases becomes alpha squared alpha squared, two alpha squared has to be equal to one. And so in order to normalize, it's a very common normalization constant, right? Boom, boom, boom. That's what those guys have to be, okay? A couple things about these uh, eigenvectors. Spin 
X component, spin Y component, spin Z component, they're Hermitian operators. How do I know that? Because you can measure them. Anything that we can measure in a laboratory is associated with a Hermitian operator. They span the space, okay? Um, any other psi can be written as a linear combination of these operators. And I wrote it, the original equation that way. It would also be true with these X eigenvectors as well, okay? Because the other set, the, the original spinners we had up and down, they were eigenvectors of the Z component of spin. Uh, these two guys right here are the eigenvectors of the X component of spin, and they're also associated with a Hermitian operator. I can have any, um, any vector I want written in that basis as well. And so that's what we're going to go about doing here, okay? We're going to go about doing that. But how do you get the state chi in the basis of the X component of angular momentum's eigenvectors? Originally, they're in the z components eigenvectors, the one, zero, zero, one, right? One, zero, zero, one. And, and this is actually a problem on the spin tutorial, by the way, if you've looked at that. I'm, I'm doing one of the problems, I guess, a uh, big reveal here. I'm doing, um, I'm doing kind of three. No, nope, I'm sorry, I'm doing 10. This is step 10 on the spin tutorial. Okay, so follow this and, and you have to go through it yourself. So how do I get from uh, the, the eigen function, the state function written in terms of the Z components of angular momentum eigenvectors, I wanna get it into the basis of the X component of, angular, of spin, spin angular momentum eigenvectors. And the answer is multiply by the identity matrix in that form. And this notation means this, these guys right here are the things I just found, are those guys. The original basis for, so that's the X component, that's SX. The original state was in this thing right here. Notice doesn't have a superscript. That's the Z component angular momentum basis vectors. Okay, so how do I get from the Z component to the X component? Well, I put in the identity matrix in right here, bloop, and also right there, bloop, and that's what's written right there and right there. Basically, I've just multiplied by one in both these two components, right? Good, good to do. Um, and then you do what you do in any other algebra problem. The notation is just admittedly tedious. I took this guy and I distributed it there and there. And so I'm left with that term and that term. Okay. The thing out front just came down. The thing out front just came down. I left the A where it was. And then I distributed this guy there and there. And that's where I got that guy and that guy. And as often is the case, okay, that those are almost like matrix elements. I had to go through and evaluate all of those. And that's what's going on down in this corner right here. And look at what it says for the very first one right here. Oh, and by the way, I, I did distribute the A and the B as well in the next line down. I, I probably could have done that in one line of algebra. You'd have hung with me, but it just seemed like the thing that makes sense to do. But it does make it look more complex than it really is. But I, in any case, I had to go out evaluating all four of these things, didn't I? And so the first one was this guy right here. And so I wrote it, boom, boom, right? And this guy is a bra, so I had to take this thing and write it in a, as, a, as a row, okay? Um, real, so I don't have to worry about the complex conjugate part, but if it's ever complex, okay, and another problem, make sure you make that complex conjugate, but it's real, so it just doesn't matter. And then I took this guy right here, and I did the multiplication, and sure enough, I got one over the square, square root of two, zero, um, one over the square root of two. And so that took care of this one, and then I had to go do this one, and sure enough, that was one over the square root of two. You can check me if you want. This one right here is one over the square root of two as well. The oddball was this one right here, this last one, uh, the minus minus state, the minus minus in, in, in both, uh, both components of, of spin uh, gave me minus one over the square root of two. 
you kind of see what that is, zero, and then minus times one give you a minus. Every other one, the, like this one right here, that minus sign, because of that zero, it still came out positive. And that's the reason for the difference. All right, so now I just, uh, I'm left with what I just found, right? The coefficient A and the one over square root of two, coefficient A, one over square root of two. This one is coefficient B, one over square root of two. And this one's coefficient B, and there's that one right there, that one uh, piece that has the slight difference minus one over square root of two. And again, the simplification technique that you should use is put all the, um, all the guys that have the same component, I'm, I'm sorry, the same unit factor, I guess, if you want all the I's together, all the J's together, all the K's together, that's all I'm doing here. I'm putting the pluses with the pluses and the minuses with the minuses. And so I got A plus B over the square root of two right there. And on the other one, I got um, A minus B over the square root of two with the, 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 I guess, closest thing to a down state, but in the X, um, in the X component of spins eigenvectors. Okay, so what does that mean? After we're done with this problem, what that means now, just like for the Z component, this thing right over here in front of the eigenvector, when you square that, that gives you the probability of one eigen uh, value being measured. When you square the thing in front of the other eigen, um, eigenvector, that gives you the probability of getting the other eigenvalue in a measurement. So if you were to measure SX this time, not XZ, SX, the X component of angular momentum, on a particle in the state chi, you would measure the plus eigenvalue, plus h bar over 2, with that thing squared's probability. And you'd measure the minus h bar over 2 with that thing's squared's probability. Okay, and so that's what that means. Interesting result. Okay, you can think about what Z would look like. We sort of did it because if you remember right, when we were talking in chapter three about just how to use these operators, I did the problem of the Z component of angular momentum, didn't I? And we went through the same thing. Now, I want an example problem. It's actually one right out of the book. This is um, one of the example problems. You have another problem on the tutorial that just gives you an initial state. Because the state the particle is in, the one-half spin particle is in, it can be anything. Those two A's and B's that we wrote, I mean, generically, it's, it's this, right? And those are chi's, not X's. Uh, that's supposed to be a plus right there. That's supposed to be a plus, and this is supposed to be a minus. Okay, in, in this particular case, you can see that A is that with the one over the square root of six, and B is that. You can check to see if they're normalized. You'll see in a second they are. And what did we say that meant? We said, if I had a particle in this state right here, how it got there, I got no idea. You know, ex, ex deus ex machina. Deus ex machina, from God comes down, makes the particle have that state. Uh, that's Greek tragedy, uh, Oedipus, all that. Never mind. If, you, if that doesn't mean anything to you, forget what I just said there. But it's a piece of Greek literature. That was often how the, the protagonist is saved. The hand of God reaches down and, and saves the protagonist or causes the protagonist to have a, uh, have a bad day. Both, it kind of went both ways for some of those people in Greek tragedies. In any event, somehow you get the particle in this state right here, and we don't care how. What's the probability, if the particle's in that state, that you will measure h bar over 2 if you go to make a measurement of the z component of angular momentum? Well, the answer would just be a squared. And in this case, a is 1 plus i over the square root of 6. So when I squared it, don't forget, multiply by the complex conjugate here, if a is complex, um, it wasn't when I was doing it before, but in this particular state, for some reason it is, all right, you get one third, don't you? Because I plus one and minus I plus one, multiply those out, you get two, that's two over six, uh, one third. And just to make sure that original eigenstate, uh, that original state was normalized, I, I would, if it, if it was, I could almost just go, well, one minus one third is two thirds, but let's just check it out and square B squared and you square one over square root of six, you get one six, you square two, yeah, sure enough, it is two thirds. So this thing was normalized. The, the original state that we had was normalized. Okay, so you got a 50-50, well, no, you don't in this case. 
normally, if you, you kind of think about a 50-50 chance of measuring up versus down eigenvalue, uh, h power over two or minus, in this particular case, it's a one-third, two-thirds because of the initial state that the particle was in. Not always 50-50. All right, now, and here's the interesting thing and, and the, the purpose of the previous result. What if this same particle in this same state chi uh, you, instead of making a Z component angular momentum measurement, you went and you made an X component of spin angular momentum, S. Okay, and the answer I guess we said was you'll measure a probability, you'll measure H power over two, that eigenvalue with a probability of the first coefficient squared. That was the coefficient of the um, eigenvector that was associated with H power over two. You'd measure that guy, okay, and you'd measure that guy with the other coefficient of that eigenvector squared. All right, so you got to go do this. A plus B here. Uh, let's see, if I add A, the 2 plus 1, that's 3, plus I. Um, I've got the 1 half right there. I got the square root of 6 squared. Uh, so let's see, 3 plus 1, that's 10. And then 2 and 6 is 12. Looks like 5 6. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to get 1 6 for the other answer because the state is normalized to start okay always has to be but let's just check that the other coefficient a minus b divided by two gives me a probability one six which i would expect there's the one half okay now i got to subtract these two guys so i got one minus two that's minus one plus i and then the complex conjugate minus one minus i let's see that's that's two okay regardless of that negative sign it still comes out one plus one is two, and then two times six is 12. Sure enough, one sixth is normalized. So in this particular case, if you made a measurement on a particle in this initial state, you made a, um, um, a measurement of the X component of the spin angular momentum, you would get five sixths of the time you measure H bar over uh, two, and uh, one sixth of the time you would measure minus H bar over two. And that is the statistical interpretation of, of quantum mechanics. All right, I didn't finish as early as I, uh, I thought I would, but I'm a few minutes earlier, and I want to make sure that you read these, par these, these, uh, these paragraphs. I think these are the three most important paragraphs in the entire chapters that we've studied. I found these guys, this, these chapters on, um, it's on page 170, and on the, this slide and the next slide, I want you all to take a second and read it because it is what you're studying here in a quantum mechanics class. It, what's, it's what's make, it, what makes the un understanding of what we're doing important. And because spin is such a simple idea, up, down, it really, uh, it really allows you to, to, to understand and it isn't clouded in a whole bunch of complex math functions, even if it's sines, cosines, Legendre polynomials, Laguerre polynomials. It is just things that you can picture. Okay, so here, here it is, and you can follow along with me as you're reading it, okay? Let's say we start out with a particle in this state right, how, right now, and notice that's the plus state. It's what we call spin up. So that's the initial condition, and um, if somebody comes up and asks you, okay, what's the z component of that particle's spin angular momentum? And I'm just going to start saying spin because it's too hard to say spin angular momentum every time. We can, without any question, say if it starts off in that state, that would be the one zero state. Okay, if you like that notation, we could say if it's in that state, we are going to measure h bar over two for its z component of angular momentum. Okay, um, but then let's say the person we're talking to says, "All right, you got that state. What if you measure the x component of the particle spin?" Well, now we we don't have an answer, right? Um, if you measure the X components, the chances are 50-50 that you're either going to get H bar over 2 or minus H bar over 2. And that's, that's troubling because, you know, for a classical class or somebody who just is very pragmatic, they, that, that's, that's an inadequate answer, okay? And so that person would say, so you're telling me that you don't know the true state of the particle? And, and this is kind of an important thing. You know precisely what the state of the particle is. Okay, um, it's it's chi plus it's up. Well, if you know precisely what the state of the particle is, how come you don't know what its x 
component of spin is? And the answer, because it just doesn't have one. It does not have a particular X component of spin. Because um, if it did, you would know both the X component and the Z component, and the uncertainty principle would be violated. Remember when we drew these diagrams for, for L, for orbital angular momentum, we said, well, there's the Z axis. We would draw, I guess, spin right there. That would be its Z component. What we said is S here could be anywhere along that cone. It doesn't have a preferred X or Y component. It can be any of those things. To violate that would be to violate the uncertainty principle, to know exactly where on that cone it was. Okay. And, and that's the kind of the significance of the space, um, space quantization diagrams that we do, drew for angular momentum. They also apply to spin. You can't know the X component if the Z component is perfectly well known. All right. So now here's the deal. So the person that you're talking with, he grabs your, your sample and he measures the X component of the spin. And let's say he gets H bar over two. He goes, you lied to me. Okay, the particle had a perfectly well-defined value of S, uh, X, X component of spin. It has H bar over two. Look, I just measured it. And your answer has to be in quantum mechanics, yeah, that's what it is now because you just collapsed the wave function, the state down to that, okay? Now you don't really know S, X, and S, Z. You only know what they are after you've made the measurement. Let it go back to where it was, measure it again, there's a 50-50 chance you'll get the other answer for the measurement. You'll get minus h bar over two if you measure the x component of angular momentum. You change the state. The guy says, well, I was very careful. I didn't alter it. Yeah, you did. Okay. That is the deal of quantum mechanics. And you know, the, the, the point of the end of this paragraph is you, know, you may get lucky and just like you could get two heads if you flipped a coin in a row, that doesn't mean over time you're not going to get half as many heads and half as many tails. So if you made 100 measurements, 50-50 uh, will, be, um, will be one and 50-50 will be the other, okay? That, that's, a, that's a problem, I guess. And I'll just let you read the third paragraph right here with, with quantum mechanics. Um, you know, it, it's either it sounds vague. It sounds like we don't know what the heck we're talking about. Maybe it sounds profound, which, you know, something out of the 60s where people shouted all kinds of like psycho babble and people thought they were very deep thinkers when they said something like that. It, it's not, okay? It's one of those things about quantum mechanics that if you find yourself sometimes going, what in the heck are we talking about here? You should find that means you are gaining an understanding of the discipline because try to communicate that to somebody who's never studied this stuff. Try to explain exactly what we just decided about the uncertainty principle between the X component and the Z component of spin if they've never looked at it. You can't. It's, it's absolutely impossible. So to some degree, the confusion of explaining this is exactly the point, okay? Um, but for spin, you might be able to at least make somebody follow you a little bit. You just tell them the rule set. But we've gone through the mathematics behind the rule set, and I think that's important. Hey, that's all I got. Any questions? on this. And I, I hope that, you know, because of all the things that we've done up to this point, the tutorial on spin uh, should be fairly straightforward. As I said, I've just done problem 10, but I think you could have figured that out because we use that same identity in earlier tutorials, the one on the direct notation. And uh, I hope so, that's good. So I'll stop sharing this. Anybody have any questions? Um, if not, I'll be setting up a uh, office hours for 3.30 again today, and uh, you'll have a great day. One more week. You know, as teachers, we like summer vacation too, you know, and we'll stop recording having admitted to that. <laughs>